Hi, Tributes. Today we're going to be talking about chapters 4 through 6 of The Hunger Games by Susan Collins. If you'd like to know what this read-along series is all about, please click the link underneath my face just to let you know what I'm doing here once again. So the fourth chapter of The Hunger Games begins with Katniss and Peeta picking up their mentor, Hamish, off of the floor covered in his own vomit. Peeta graciously offers to clean Hamish up, but this makes Katniss feel a little conflicted. What is Peeta trying to do? Is he trying to get on Hamish's good side by taking care of the drunk man? Katniss resolves at this point she's going to have nothing else to do with Peeta. She decides she can't develop any kind of affections for him. Why, Whispering Wind? Because they are in the Hunger Games and caring for anybody but yourself inside the arena only causes trouble. Thank you, Whispering Wind. Katniss goes to bed that night reminiscing about home. About how her and Prim first gathered dandelions to make a salad about how she first went hunting all by herself after her father died, and how she was finally able to provide meat for her family, and how she first started trading goods at the hob, and how distant her mother became after her father died, and Katniss's distrust for her ever since. Katniss goes to bed that night feeling unexplainably sad, but unable to cry. The next morning, at breakfast, Katniss is greeted by Effie, who's running out of the dining car because of something insulting Hamish had said to her. And Peeta's there, and Hamish is still drinking alcohol from the night before. Katniss has never seen so much food on the table at one time. She drinks hot chocolate for the first time and loves it, and she eats until her stomach is about to burst. It's here we learn that once tributes get into the arena, they can acquire things called sponsors. Sponsors are people of higher means, normally from the capital, who provide money for the tributes so that their mentors can give them provisions from afar into the arena. But in District 12's case, they have nary a sponsor most years. And that's because of Hamich. Most potential sponsors view Hamich as pretty much a big joke. However, once Peeta and Katniss both display to Hamich that they are both fighters, he makes a deal with them. He's going to stay sober enough so that he can help them in the arena. So they enter the capital and it's bigger, brighter, and better than like anything Katniss has ever seen. The train pulls into the station and Katniss and Peeta are immediately whisked away to be prepped by their fashion teams. Each tribute gets their own glam squad, which determines their new look for pre-Hunger Games events and interviews. Katniss can't help but think how odd the Capitol people are, with their crazy hair, outrageous clothes, and their funny-sounding accents. Katniss hates what the stylists have to do to her, rip her hair out all over the place, and make her look like somebody she's not. But she doesn't fight it. Hamish told her to trust her fashion team, and so reluctantly she does. Katniss can't help but have an immediate connection with her main stylist, Sina. Sina is different from everybody else at the Capitol that she's encountered so far. He doesn't wear outrageous clothes, and he doesn't have a strange accent. After Sina presents Katniss with a lavish lunch, he says, How despicable this must seem to you. And it's true. The capital lives in wild abundance compared to Katniss's meager life at home. Now, for the opening ceremonies. Your style is dressed you, and your costume is meant to reflect your district. District 12 being coal miners, the costumes normally fall a bit short of the more interesting districts. But Sina comes up with a different, dare I say, ingenious idea. He dresses Katniss in a simple black unitard with leather boots, add a helmet and cape with streaks of red, orange, and yellow. When Katniss and Peter are going out into the opening ceremonies, Sina's gonna light them on fire. That's right. On fire. So Katniss and Peta board their chariot which will parade them around the opening ceremonies for all of Panem to see. So soon it's their turn to roll out in their chariot. Sina lights their capes on fire, but all Katniss feels is a slight little tickle. It's fake fire, not the real burning kind of fire. His last command to the tributes is to hold hands as they wheel out into the opening ceremonies. Katniss gets a good look of herself on a big screen and can't help but admit that her and Peeta look amazing. No one will be able to forget them, and this gives Katniss excitement. Perhaps they'll be able to garner some sponsors this year. Maybe she can win after all. They enter the training center, and everyone can't stop commenting about how amazing she and Peeta looked. The whole time, Katniss realized her and Peeta were holding each other's hands for dear life. Katniss is caught off guard when Peeta gives a comment about how beautiful she looked. Katniss has to remind herself that Peeta is her enemy and is probably planning to soften her up in the arena. Two can play at this game, she thinks, and gives Peeta a kiss on the cheek. Their living quarters in the training center are even more plush than at the train. 
So dinner is served, and it's a pretty cordial affair. So after dinner, dessert is set down by a red-headed servant girl who Katniss can't help but say that she recognizes, and everyone is taken aback. The red-headed servant girl is called an Avox, or a servant of the capital. This means that she has defied the capital at one point, committing whatever it is that they deem treason. The penalty you get for this, besides becoming a servant, is having your tongue cut out. Katniss slowly remembers where she recognizes the Avox girl from and can't help but be sickened by the memory. Peta saves the day when he suggests that the Avox girl looks like a girl from their school back in District 12. And that's where Katniss must have gotten the resemblance mixed up. And the tension at the table instantly releases. Katniss and Peta head to bed, but before they do, they head up to the roof, just to chill out and calm down. It's here, under the noise of the wind and the wind chimes of the roof's garden, that Katniss tells Peta the story of how she knows the Avox girl. One day, when her and Gail were hunting in the woods, they came across two runaways, a boy and a girl, from the capital. A hovercraft appeared out of nowhere and killed the boy and captured the girl. And the girl is the Avox girl. Katniss admits that she feels bad and that she probably could have saved them if she had acted more quickly. Katniss heads down to bed and encounters the Avox girl again, and she feels terribly conflicted. There's a million things she wants to say to her, but Katniss knows that there are cameras everywhere watching her every move. At the end of Chapter 6, Katniss can't help but wonder if the Avox girl is angry at her for not helping her escape. Katniss wonders if the Avox girl will enjoy watching her die in the arena. So that's Chapters 4 through 6, guys. We're almost to the games. It's time for some discussion questions. How does the capital seem to you? Does it seem like a beautiful place? Do you think that the people of the capital are ignorant and arrogant? Or, for lack of a better word, do you think that they're just stupid? They're oblivious to the hardships in the other districts, that's for sure. How do you think that the capital differs from our government? I don't know about you, but I can see some similarities between our real-life government and the fictional capital. Can you point out any similarities? Also, how do you feel about the Avox girl? All we can assume that she did wrong was that she ran away from the capital. Do you think that this dictates as severe of a punishment as getting her tongue cut off? More importantly, why do you think that the punishment for a traitor is that they get their tongue removed? As always, guys, visit thehungerdame.blogspot.com for all Hunger Games news. Visit hungergamestrilogy.net, one of the best Hunger Games fan sites out there. Also, listen to the Hunger Games Fireside Chat podcast. You can view that on iTunes. And I found this really cool thing. It's called Panem Radio. You can listen to it at panemradio.com, which is just basically streaming a whole bunch of Hunger Games-inspired music, and it's pretty awesome. You can listen to it as you're reading along with the books, and it's, it's a pretty cool thing to do. I thought it was really neat, so you should go check it out. So the next video will be up in the next five days about chapters 7, 8, and 9. Until then, guys, happy Hunger Games!